So my name is Stephen Liu. Um, I'll be the host uh, for introducing Professor Philip Griffith. Uh, we are very pleased, uh, very honored for that he will uh, be giving a colloquium talk uh, for the CRM. Uh, this is uh, the uh, a colloquium talk about Hodge theory. Now, Professor Griffiths is a world authority in many areas of mathematics. And in fact, he created the, um, or pioneered many aspects of Hodge theory, including uh, variation Hodge structures, especially. And he's the one who motivated uh, uh, the subject, which is extremely, extremely important in the um, uh, analysis of geometric object in algebraic geometry, for example and for, uh, for the study of moduli space whenever there's a variation of uh, moduli. Hodge theory often finds its way and is the tool people use in uh, algebraic geometry for uh, solving problems. So th this is, uh, uh, Hodge theory is really uh, one of the key tools and I'm, I'm very honored to introduce you to Professor Griffiths. He's currently at the, uh, Institute of Advanced Studies, Princeton. Uh, he's a professor at Miami University. So, uh, Professor Griffiths, you can uh, well, let him take over. Okay. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and uh, thank uh, everyone for the uh, invitation to give this colloquium today and for joining it. Um, the topic is that I will talk about is Hodge theory and moduli. I'll begin with some introduction, <clears throat> then some background uh, discussion about moduli, about Hodge theory, and some general properties. And the main part of the talk in some ways is an example of uh, the use of Hodge theory to study moduli, uh, an example of a particular algebraic surface called an I surface. It's sort of the first non classical, and I'll explain what that means, algebraic surface that one comes to, a uh, general type. Moduli is a topic of central interest in algebraic geometry in the classification of algebraic varieties, you have first discrete invariants like Hilbert polynomial, and within each class with the same discrete invariants, then you have moduli. That's all of the algebraic varieties uh, with those invariants. The classic example is algebraic curves, compact Riemann surfaces, and the discrete invariant is the genus. A continuous invariant, if you like, is the point in moduli. In general varieties, the building blocks for general algebraic variety are varieties of general type. So-called Kadar dimension is the same as the dimension or the canonical bundles positive. That's like Riemann surfaces of genus bigger than or equal to two. Uh, kalabi yau varieties, Kadara number is zero, canonical is trivial. That's like elliptic curves, genus one, uh, Kalabi. And then Fano varieties, Kadara number is minus infinity. Uh, canonical is anti-ample. And that's like uh, the Riemann sphere of rational varieties. Today I'll be mainly concerned with the first type. <clears throat> The techniques for studying moduli roughly divide into at least three types. Uh, the algebraic ones, birational geometry, singularity, uh, GIT, and so on. That is the main tool uh, used to supplement the algebraic uh, 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 methods. Uh, one uses Hodge theoretic ones. That's uh, what I'll be talking about today both the topological aspects of Hodge theory and the geometric. 
and also analytic L2 D bar techniques, construction and properties of special metrics. Um, these, of course, interact. And today I'm going to be focusing on the second one, how it can be used to uh, get some understanding of uh, moduli. Varieties of general type uh, with ideas from the minimal model program, Kolar, Shepard Barron, and Alexiev in the 80s and early 90s proved the existence of a moduli space that has a canonical completion. What that means is a point of script M is corresponds, if you like, to a smooth variety of general type. And completing it means that you add on certain degenerations, singular ones, that you obtain by specializing the smooth one, but only in very particular ways. Uh, in the references, there is the original paper of Kolar, Shepard, Baron, Alexiev. Well, Alexiev is a different paper, and especially the survey paper by Kolar. Um, so the general motivating question today is, what is the structure of the completion? And by structure, I mean stratifying the completion. It's a, a complete projective variety will be a union of strata and the individual strata would consist of deformation types of the deformations of varieties, perhaps singular, of the same deformation type. Uh, if you like, if they're singular, they should be equisingular deformations. So the method we'll use to study this question is to use Hodge theory and anticipating some of the uh, terms I'll recall the definition of later, uh, one will use the period mapping. So for smooth varieties, there's associated to it a Hodge structure. These are canonical, or they're, these are general type algebraic varieties, so they have canonical polarizations. And the period mapping takes the Hodge structure on the cohomology. Uh, that's the invariant. And we call script P the image, script P bar will be the canonical minimal completion of P. That will be explained uh, during the talk. So what the way one thinks of it geometrically is you have smooth varieties in the interior of moduli and they will degenerate in certain very controlled ways. That's the Kolar, Shepard, Baron, Alexiev completion. And one would like to use Hodge theory to understand what those degenerations can look like. There's another type of sub-varieties in this uh, completion. And going back to smooth varieties, a Hodge structure is a linear algebra uh, construction on the cohomology or reflecting the complex structure, it may have certain special properties not present for general Hodge structures. For example, it may be a direct sum of two sub Hodge structures. Uh, or the more technical way of saying it is that the algebra of Hodge classes and the tensor algebra may be bigger than it is generally. That gives some stratification also on the set of Hodge structures and that induces one on the uh, canonical completion, the script P bar. The model example that uh, is very simple, but it's what one begins with is uh, Riemann surfaces of genus two. There, a general one is a smooth Riemann surface when the Hodge structure degenerates, that's the solid line. And here you have really a Hodge, it's degenerated to a, uh, the 
curve is degenerated to a curve of arithmetic genus two, but with one node, a singularity. Or the other type of degeneration is the Hodge structure becomes reducible. It's a direct sum of the Hodge structures of these two. And this then is the picture of the stratification. These are the different strata that appear in the completed moduli space of genus two curves. The general case, MG bar is a very beautiful a uh, much more complex, but very beautiful object that's much studied. But it's this simple picture that one at least begins with. So the results that I'll talk about today are first, uh, I'm going to be restricting to the case of surfaces. Uh, one reason for doing that uh, is that so far as I know, there's really no example of a general type surface where the moduli space completed has been fully worked out. Uh, there is the work of Franciosi, Pardini, and Rolinsky that I'll be speaking about that takes this eye surface case and goes a long way toward the classification of what the strata and moduli are. But as far as the full understanding of the stratification uh, of a general type surface, uh, there's not really one that has yet been completely done. And we wanted to see how Hodge theory might be used to help get some understanding of what this completed moduli space uh, looks like. Okay, so for the completed moduli space for the eye surface, then Roughly speaking, there are three things that one can say. The first is that if you restrict to Gorenstein degenerations, uh, these have a technical algebraic definition. Uh, the canonical uh, sheaf is a line bundle. This is the Ve canonical divisor. Um, I think uh, one may think of it, at least in first, appro first approximation, that they have many other properties of smooth surfaces, uh, Riemann rock holes, things like that. So for that part of the completion of Gorenstein degenerations, then there will be a pretty complete analogous picture to the one that was here. The second, which is, uh, I think, uh, quite interesting, is in the case of curves, uh, the moduli space completed is basically smooth. The Kuranishi space at each point is smooth of dimension 3g minus 3. Uh, the singularities are very mild. They're roughly quotient by fin uh, finite groups. That's not the case when you come to KSBA completions. Basically, any uh, normal singularity must be singular on the boundary. So an interesting question is, how do you desingularize the moduli? And their Hodge theory is proving very useful. As I'll try to explain, it sort of guides you to what you should do to at least at a general point for the eye surface case, it tells you completely what you should do to desingularize the moduli. Finally, there are the normal non Gorenstein degenerations. Uh, these are less well understood, they're only partial results. Um, there's one very interesting example that I'll try to discuss. So summarizing, I think this is what I just said, and I'll leave those are in the notes, so I won't go back over that now. For background, I will begin with just a very informal account of moduli. We're going to consider moduli spaces whose points are equivalence classes of varieties that have the property that they're either smooth or have canonical singularities. Canonical singularities are ones that are very, they're the mildest ones 
that you can have, they don't really affect the behavior of the holomorphic differentials, the top degree differentials. Uh, you can't have poles, if you like, on uh, top degree differentials that are holomorphic outside the singular locus. And the canonical uh, bundle should be ample. So for this talk, so this is for the type of, uh, of algebraic varieties that we're interested in, uh, surfaces with these properties. Whoops. So for this talk, there are two main points. The first is that the canonical completion exists. That's the theorem of Kolar, Shepard, Baron, and Alexiev. And secondly, that in the case of dimension one, algebraic curves, and dimension two, surfaces, there's a classification of the singularities that can occur. So you know locally what the singularities of the limit surfaces can look like. Um, so going back to the first point, the canonical completion, the definition is this. It's that if you have a family over the puncture disk, smooth outside the origin, then you want to define a unique limit and these are the conditions. This is the condition that the VEDA visor should be, uh, some multiple should be a line bundle, should have semi-log canonical singularities. I'll say, uh, I'll tell you what those are in a moment and the canonical should be ample. For B, uh, that's global, this is local. The nature of the singularities is local. Globally, the, uh, well, uh, yeah, go back here and just say the condition B here, the semi-log canonical one, means that the total space in the family should have only canonical singularities. So the simplest uh, singularities possible should exist on the total space. And that then imposes semi-log canonical singularities on the singular fiber. Okay. To explain a bit what these singularities look like, I'm going to break them up into normal. These are isolated and non-normal, non-isolated and either Gorenstein or non-Gorenstein. That's the property of the canonical bundle. In the, whoops. Sorry. In this spot here, this is where the canonical bundle is non-Gorenstein there's a smallest integer such that some multiple of the Vey canonical divisor is a line bundle. Uh, it's called the index. And one of the problems in general problems in the theory of which there's quite a lot of work going on is to give some reasonable bound for the index. Uh, I think the bound now is somewhere around 4,000. For the I surface, the conjectural bound is two. And I'll show you uh, a non-Gorenstein I surface, which has uh, index two. So the canonical Gorenstein, these include the canonical singularities, and there's a rich and vast literature. There are Duval or ADE singularities, uh, Here's the, the, the uh, simplest ones are the AN singularities that locally look like this. The remaining singularities are either simple elliptic or cusps. And a constraint in the moduli theory of surfaces 
is that for isolated singularities, they should be smoothable. It's by no means the case that the that an isolated singularity of a local surface, just a piece of a surface, is smoothable. Uh, and if it's smoothable, it may be smoothable in many different ways. For moduli theory, what we're talking about today, those isolated singularities should be smoothable. And that means that the degree of the simple elliptic singularity should, between, should be between one and nine. I'll explain what that is. I, to do that, I go back to the standard resolution of the singularity, singular surface, isolated elliptic singularity. You resolve that singularity, replace the point by an elliptic curve, a smooth elliptic curve, C tilde, and the self-intersection number of that C tilde is the degree, and it should be between one and nine. The other types of sing isolated singularities are quotient singularities, and here they're defined. These are the notations that people in singularity theory use. The canonical non-Gorenstein, they're required to be Q Gorenstein smoothable, and there's again a very interesting non-trivial uh, non discussion of this in some of the references. I've mentioned one there. For KSBA singularities, not all of these quotient singularities can occur. In fact, the only ones that occur are these called wall singularities and two more. And then they're listed in the Kolar reference, these two. We're going to be particularly concerned with the wall singularities when the first one, when D is one and N is two. The non-isolated singularities are given by pairs of the surface and a, a double curve having isolated pinch points. Pinch point, a double curve means you have two, looks like having two planes in C3 meeting transversely. The pinch point is when the planes become tangent at a point. Uh, it's a Whitney swallowtail. And there is again, in this case, you desingularize the uh, surface in a standard way. The double curve then becomes a smooth curve with an involution and you get the original surface by taking the quotient via the involution on the singular curve. A particularly interesting example of the non-isolated singularity is due to Lula Verlinsky. Here you take the projective plane and you identify opposite pairs of lines. L1 is identified uh, with L, uh, L2 and L3 with L4. So you are identifying P1s with three bark points on each. And there are different ways of doing this according to how you identify those mark points. One particular one of these is going to be the degenerate uh, eye surface, the most degenerate one. Of course, to make this construction, if you just think of sticking these opposite pairs of lines together, you don't know what to do where the lines intersect. So you have to blow them up. And this is the picture, the soldered lines are the blown up, are the proper transforms of the lines in the plane. The dotted lines are the blow ups. And this is the picture of the particular Lou Verlinsky degenerate eye surface. I'll give you the actual equation of that surface uh, in three-dimensional space at the end of the talk. We're going to be particularly interested in two sub-varieties of the completed moduli space. One is the singular surfaces, points on the boundary, that when you smooth them, 
you get over the punctured disc a fiber bundle topologically because you have a family of smooth surfaces over a circle uh, topologically and you have monodromy and the monodromy could be finite. That's a, a locus in moduli. And the other is the Gorenstein part of moduli, the per surfaces whose singularities are Gorenstein. In this case, the canonical bundle and dualizing sheaf uh, coincide and duality, Riemann rock and so on, hold as if the th uh, X were smooth. <coughs> From Hodge theory, there are two interrelated aspects that will be discussed today. The topological one, the deeper topological properties of complex algebraic varieties um, mostly arise from the functorial Hodge structure or mixed Hodge structure on the cohomology. Uh, you know, the, for example, for smooth projective varieties, the hard Lefschetz theorem, it's a Hodge theoretic result. And some of the analytical properties of Hodge structures, I mentioned monodromy of a family over the punctured disk of smooth varieties. There's a monodromy uh, operator. It has a Jordan decomposition into semi-simple and unipotent part. The semi-simple part is of finite order, eigenvalues or roots of unity, and the unipotent part has index of unipotency of uh, less or equal to one. So Lie theory and complex analysis uh, combine to give <coughs> what <coughs> the analytic properties of what happens to the Hodge structure on the cohomology of the smooth variety when it degenerates. Okay. And the ways in which the Hodge structures can degenerate are classified by Lie theory. Uh, there's a reference here to that. So one knows from a Lie theory perspective how Hodge structures can degenerate. And you want to use that to say, okay, this gives you information on how the algebraic varieties can degenerate by following the variety as it degenerates, what happens to its Hodge structure. Other uses of Hodge theory, uh, geometric ones, sometimes associated to a Hodge structure uh, or a first order variation of such, their algebra geometric objects, uh, the most classical being Riemann's theta divisor. Uh, I won't be getting into this uh, today. Uh, I just mentioned it. It's a sort of how one can take a Hodge structure or a first order variation of a Hodge structure and construct a geometric object. And there's also non abelian Hodge theory, the study initiated by Simpson of the fundamental groups of algebraic varieties via their linear representations. And again, a beautiful subject that I won't have a chance to say much about today. I mentioned earlier the stratification. P bar is going to be the canonical minimal completion of the image of the period mapping. It's the minimal amount of information you have to add in to complete the period mapping to something compact. And just to give you the words, you have limiting mixed Hodge structures. These are what you get in the limit when the Hodge structure, when the variety degenerates and you follow its Hodge structure in. And the, the limiting mixed Hodge structure is a filtered object. It's a successive extension of pure Hodge structures taking the associated graded, that's what the p-bar will be. You throw out the extension data, that's p-bar. Another type in the stratification are the ones I mentioned earlier when the polarized hot structure decomposes or when you have additional symmetries 
in the Hodge structure not pleasant, present in a general one. So if we think of P-bar as having a generalized stratification of some kind, putting in the limits and putting in the Hodge structures with symmetries not present in a general one. The boundary components, these are what turn up when the Hodge structure degenerates. And very roughly, there are two types, those over the rationals and those over the integers. There's not really a formal definition of these, the ones over the integers that I've seen uh, really worked out. Um, so I'm just going to take that to be the conjugacy class of a semi-simple part closely related to the spectrum of isolated hypersurface singularities. For the former, the Q boundary component, I'm going to take the Q conjugacy class of N. N is a nilpotent transformation on a vector space, and there's a, a classification of what the, uh, what the types can be. For n equals one, hot structures of weight one, algebraic curves, n squared must be zero. And so the only invariant is the rank. For n equals two, algebraic surfaces, n squared is zero, then there's the rank. n squared is not zero, then the classification is the rank of n and the rank of n squared. And this is a pictorial representation of the stratification for algebraic curves. This is the smooth curves. Uh, so I sub zero means smooth. I sub one means one node. Rank of n is, uh, is one and so on up to rank n equals g. The rank is no bigger than the genus. So for n equals two, this is the diagram you get. Uh, it's not linear. It's not like curves. Um, when you get up to weight three and more, it's even more complicated than this. Here it's transitive. If you go here and degenerate there, or go here and you get the same answer. That's no longer true when n equals three. When you get up to, for example, Calabi Al three folds. For some general results, uh, if we take first just a comment that the moduli space, moduli for general type varieties uh, are very complicated. Uh, basically, it's known that the structure can be arbitrarily nasty. Um, this is Fakil's paper on Murphy's Law for moduli. So for what I'll be talking about today, I'm thinking of algebraic surfaces whose moduli space is reduced. And for the most part, we should really think of it as being a smooth, at least at a general point. The examples we'll consider have that property. Then you have a period mapping, as mentioned earlier, and the image in the set of all possible Hodge structures identified by monodromy um, is a locally closed analytic subvariety. It was just recently proved that, in fact, it's a quasi projective algebraic variety over which the Hodge line bundle is ample uh, using totally new ideas in the subject coming from model theory, old minimal structures and so on. A hope for a result, it's not yet proved in general, is that this completion that I described earlier informally should itself be a projective variety over which the Hodge line bundle, which I won't define here, it's in the references, should be ample. What's known is that it exists as a compact Hausdorff space with a stratification by complex analytic varieties over each of the strata, the Hodge line bundle is ample. 
but the full structure of it has not yet been completely uh, established. As a set, it consists of the associated graded polar polarized hot structures to the equivalence classes of limiting mixed hot structures. The essential geometric content of the statement that this map exists is that for the Kolar, the KSBA moduli space, you can assign a unique associated graded to the limit surface. It doesn't depend on how it's smoothed. Okay, so this is a non trivial result about the Hodge theoretic nature of the singularities that can occur. Uh, there's an explanation of this in the notes. I'm not going to go over that here as it's not essential. So that's the first general result is that to this minimal completion of the image of the period map, there's a mapping of completed moduli space to this object. The next general result is that if you look at the parts of moduli around which monodromy is finite, then the period mapping actually extends across those. Uh, if you have finite monodromy, even though the variety degenerates, you can associate uniquely a polarized Hodge structure to the limit. So it's singular, but it has a uniquely defined polarized Hodge structure. That's the finite monodromy condition. Okay. And the non Gorenstein part of moduli, the part where the canonical divisor is not a line bundle, those I gave you the list of what those singularities could be, the isolated ones before. And those all have finite monodromy. So when you're having to deal with a non Gorenstein part of moduli, the thing we know less, least about, at least the monodromy is finite. You're not going out to infinity in the Hodge theoretic sense. So this is just an explanation of the right reason for that result that normal surfaces with rational singularities uh, are parameterized, they have finite monodromy and normal non-Gorenstein, uh, it has to be non-Gorenstein, those are all rational. And this is just a further explanation of that point. An unknown question is whether the non-normal eye surfaces always have infinite monodromy. In other words, once you get away from isolated singularities, do you, does that force the Hodge structure to go to infinity when the variety acquires such singularities? Not known. It's true in all known examples so far. So now let's go back to normal surfaces, things with isolated singularities. Uh, they're either elliptic singularities or cusps. And one can say, ask, okay, how many of such singularities can you have? And there, there's a nice Hodge theoretic result. Uh, it bounds the number of elliptic singularities by the PG, that's the dimension of the space of holomorphic two forms from above and below by the rank. It should actually be one half the rank. I've left off a half here. Same thing for the cusp, the upper bound and a lower bound by the rank of N squared. This is in contrast to ordinary double points where it's very hard to bound the number of ordinary double points that a surface can have. Uh, you can do it by uh, the sort of intersection matrix. That's probably uh, the standard way of getting some sort of bound, but it's not nearly uh, as sharp a bound as you do get once you, once the hot structure has to go to infinity as it does with elliptic singularities or cusps, you get much stronger bounds. 
and I think I won't go into that because um, I want to spend the remaining time discussing the eye surfaces. So an eye surface is by definition of a surface smooth or having canonical singularities, which is minimal, means it has no minus one curves. So uh, that's the technical uh, definition. It's regular. In fact, these are simply connected and PG is two. And K squared is one. That's the smallest the number can be. So in general, for regular surfaces, there's a bound on PG. That's, the, that's like the genus of a curve of a Riemann surface. That's the dimension of the space of holomorphic two forms. And the standard bound that was given by Max Noerder in the 1880s is this number here. And once you have surfaces that are close to extremal, those seem to have very favorable qualities. Their moduli spaces, the ones we know, uh, tend to be uh, smooth and uh, you tend to have local Torelli, that is the Hodge structure locally determines the variety properties and so on. So for the use of Hodge theory to study moduli, this is a class of surfaces, the ones which are close to satisfying this condition that seem to have nice properties. So for the eye surface informally stated, what one can show is that on the Gorenstein part, the stratification on moduli maps to the stratification on the completed period mapping and it's surjective and one-to-one -one on components. In other words, all possible Hodge theoretic degenerations that can occur actually do occur. All possible degenerations in the algebra geometric sense are reflected, faithfully reflected by Hodge theoretic degenerations. And the second part, which is, I think, of uh, the more, the newest, uh, the, uh, the part that's more new is that the extension data in the limiting mixed Hodge structure desingularizes the completed moduli space at a general point over the boundary. So if you want to know, okay, you've got this singular object, the completed moduli space, uh, I'll give you the dimensions in a moment that show you the boundary is quite singular. How do you desingularize the thing? The answer is instead of looking at the associated graded to the limiting mixed Hodge structure as you go to the limit, that's well defined on the KSPA moduli side, you take the corresponding extension data toss that in and that tends to, that does desingularize a, de a general point on the boundary. FPR are the papers I mentioned, Francesi, uh, Franciosi, Pardini, Rolinski. So these are some properties of eye surfaces. This gives you the dimension of the space of differentials, uh, vanishing and so on. Uh, works as if you had smooth uh, surfaces. So these are the tools one uses to analyze what uh, what Gorenstein eye surfaces can look like, even the, sing the singular ones. Uh, the pluricanonical ring has the postulated form, meaning that you have to add generators and relations only when they're required by these dimensions. That's what the question mark there means as the dimensions on the previous page. Classically from Castanova and Riquez and the work of Bombieri and others, one studies surfaces of general type by their pluricanonical maps. You take the holomorphic, m-fold holomorphic differentials, things that are of the form dz wedge dz2, 
to the nth power globally defined and holomorphic and use those as homogeneous coordinates to map the surface to a projective space. And it's frequently, uh, and this is for algebraic geometers sort of standard, rather than mapping to a projective space, you use weighted projective spaces. So these weights corresponding to the degree of the differential. These are ordinary holomorphic differentials. These are double differentials. It's a DA, DZ1 wedge DZ2 squared and so on. And you map to weighted projective space using those things as homogeneous coordinates. And when you do that, you realize the I surface in this weighted projective space as a hypersurface whose equation has this form. The coordinates T0, T1 have weight one, Y has weight two, Z has weight five. So this is what they look like. And geometrically, they're two sheeted coverings over the projective space P112. P112 is a quadric, geometrically, it's a singular uh, quadric in three space cone. And it's a branch, two sheeted branch covering branched over a quintic, that's the F10 part, and the vertex. So you can mod analyze the moduli of these things either from the equation or cohomologically using the sort of algebraic techniques, uh, computing chief cohomology, uh, the Kuranishi space, uh, the H1 of the tangent chief, and so on. And what one finds is that the moduli space is reduced and smooth of dimension 28, local Torelli holds locally the surface uniquely determined by its Hodge structure. Um, and one of the reasons that we started studying this example is that it's non-classical. So let me explain just briefly what that means. The space of Hodge structures, period domain, is a homogeneous complex manifold. The classical case is when it's Hermitian symmetric. Those are the ones that are familiar. That's what you, algebraic curves. You have the Siegel upper half space, Abelian variety, same thing. K3s, you have the uh, Hermitian symmetric domain of type four. Um, in those cases, it, the, all of the potential Hodge structures may be realized geometrically. But in the non-classical case, there's a differential constraint on the period map. You cannot map onto open sets. You have to map into a sub bundle of the tangent bundle. In the case of I surfaces, so that's this differential constraint. In the case of I surfaces, this differential constraint is a contact structure. This is a com homogeneous complex manifold. It's actually a contact manifold. And the differential constraint is that you have to map into the contact subbundle. So these, that's the dimension of the period domain. From Noether's formula, you can find that the H11 has dimension 28. And from the local Torelli property, you find that the image of moduli is a contact submanifold in the period space. These are just the cohomological computations. The monodromy group is known to be arithmetic. Uh, it's not known if it's the full arithmetic group uh, there are some reasons for thinking it should be. Uh, since k squared is one, the ordinary, the decomposition of the cohomology into the multiples of the, the turn, first turn class and the orthogonal is actually unimodular. And it's suspected, but so far as I know, not proved that the intersection form here is even it has the maximum number of E8s allowed by the signature, and that the monodromy should be the full arithmetic group. 
the sort of arithmetic reasons that pre prevent that and, and other examples are taken care of or are not present in this case because k squared is one. So this is the picture of how the Hodge structures written here as the Hodge diamonds can degenerate. I won't go over this. I just put it to sort of give an illustrative, an illustration of how one pictorially imagines how the Hodge structures degenerate. If you go back up here, these are smooth. The type one degeneration, the Hodge diamond, these are the weight one part, this is the weight two part, this is the weight three part, and the weight one part, n squared is zero, the rank of n is two. And that means you have a Hodge structure of weight one and dimension two, okay? So this is, these are just the notations for the associated graded of the limiting mixed Hodge structure. So what would you expect algebra geometrically from this Hodge theoretic picture? Okay, so let's imagine that you do a semi-stable reduction. You have these family of surfaces requiring an isolated elliptic singularity you want to replace the family by one where over the origin is a normal crossing surface, smooth surfaces meeting transversely, okay? Well, just from the Hodge theory, since n squared is zero, you don't expect triple points, you expect only double points. Only a double curve. And since the PG drops by one in the limit, you may reasonably expect that the one differential that becomes singular becomes a differential who gives you, when you take its residue on the double curve, a, a one form, holomorphic one form on a curve should be an elliptic curve. So even if you didn't know the KSBA degeneration classification, Hodge theory would say what you expect when you acquire a simple elliptic singularity is an elliptic curve, uh, is, is an elliptic, uh, um, a simple elliptic singularity. What about the degree of that? There you have to go to the semi-simple part of monodromy. And there the result is that the semi-simple part from that you can read off the degree of the elliptic curve. Uh, the c squared, c total squared is a minus d. You can read off the d. Uh, basically, in the semi-simple part of monodromy is the so-called coxeter element of the corresponding Dinkin diagram. So in this table here, these are all of the strata. These are the normal uh, elliptic singularity degenerations. You can have at most three because the PG is two. <clears throat> these are the degrees. So these are smooth, elliptic of degree two, elliptic of degree one. This is the number of elliptic singularities and the di are the degrees. And here notice that the sum of these two numbers here is always, the sum of these two is always this, okay? And that this one plus the dimension of moduli is 28. So this number plus this one equals the dimension of moduli. So what does this diagram tell you? I'll conclude by just saying, uh, it's in the notes in more detail, what this diagram tells you. Um, what it suggests is that as the surface degenerates, it acquires a simple elliptic singularity. You, to resolve 
in moduli that singularity, you do semi-stable reduction. So what do you want to do? You want to desingularize the surface. That becomes a smooth surface with an elliptic curve whose self-intersection is the di or minus the di. Unions, one other piece. And those two pieces should be glued together along the double curve. Okay. Well, an elliptic curve is a cubic curve in the plane. So what you would expect the other piece to be is the plane, the projective plane, but you've got to blow it up a certain number of times to have the a smoothable union of a pair of smooth surfaces to be able to be smoothable. There are conditions on the normal bundles of the double curve in the two pieces. Okay. And the number of points you have to blow up exactly is this di. You have to blow up uh, points to uh, have the normal bundle condition satisfied for smoothability. Okay, so what do you get? You get a del pezzo. So what this is telling you is that you should stick in uh, over the singular point in moduli the union of the desingularized surface with a del pezzo glued along the common elliptic curve. And when you work out the numbers, you get exactly the right count. And that tells you, in fact, you desingularize moduli in this way. Those points that you blow up are the extension data in the limiting mixed Hodge structure. The limiting mixed Hodge structure is basically the first cohomology of the elliptic curve a certain number of times, direct sum a certain number of times. The, when you work out what it is, you've really taken the extension data, which gives you the position of the points on the elliptic curve that you blow up. And that's the extension data interpreted geometrically. So the extension data tells you which points on the elliptic curve to blow up. And when you blow those up, that's how you desingularize moduli at a general point of these boundary components. And in the notes is just, I've written out uh, what, uh, what I just said. I want to close by going back to the Lee Rolinsky example. That was P2, where you had four lines and you identified opposite pairs of lines. Uh, the description of the surface, uh, the singular surface desingularized is P2 with a plane cordic in this. So the Lou Berlinski one, it's four lines, it's quadrilateral. And, whoops. This is the picture that the extension data in the limiting mixed Hodge structure suggests for what you stick in to desingularize moduli at that over the Lou Berlinski surface. And that's its equation when you do this. Okay, thank you. Stephen? Are there any questions? I have a question. Sure. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, I, I was wondering uh, a little bit, you made a comment in passing when you were talking about the uh, limit mixed Hodge structures, I think it was slide 27, about uh, some issues surrounding the rationality versus the integrality. I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit on, on what the issues are constructing uh, this thing integrally rather than rationally. Um, so the monodromy has the semi-simple part, so that's an integral 
It's in the GZ, the integral transformations, and it has eigenvalues, roots of unity. Uh, the unipotent part, uh, that's over Q. And there, there is a, one has classified all the conjugacy classes, there are orbit type objects uh, for possible unipotent parts of monodromy. The semi-simple parts, of uh, we, you know, we really don't know much more other than what I just said. So as far as making any sort of structure saying that here is a parameter space where you've included not just the uh, information of the limiting mixed hot structure over Q, but also over Z. Uh, there's not really, so far as I know, a general structure uh, that's been worked out for this. In examples, you can write out things pretty explicitly uh, using Clement Schmidt or using the Steenbrink the uh, descriptions of the limiting mixed hot structure. So you can work out what various bilinear forms over Z are and stuff like that. But the general, uh, there's no general theory that I'm aware of uh, that's, been, that's been developed for this. Oh, okay, thank you. Thanks, Brent. And, uh, are there any other questions? I would like to ask one last question about the situation on the eye surfaces. We have a very pretty uh, clear picture uh, how to classify the singularities and how, how to uh, desingularize them. Do you expect exactly the same thing, uh, the same picture for the case of more general, for PG being greater, for example? Or other uh, the next surface up, uh, it's called an H surface. That's when K squared is two. H stands for Hurakawa because he did a lot of work uh, back in the 70s on surfaces with small K squared. Right. That has a picture that's very similar to the I surface with some additional features. Uh, that, for example, the eye surface, the eye surface, uh, these are all irreducible with one exception. There's only one reducible one. The A surface, it's a little more complicated. So the sort of feeling I have is that if you restrict yourself to irreducible uh, limits, it's sort of like algebraic curves. This is pretty, you know, you can draw the, it's a much simpler situation than the combinatorics you get into if you allow an arbitrary stable curve. And I have a feeling that a bit of that type of phenomena will occur when you take these Noether extremal surfaces and you let the PG get larger, that it will have many of the characteristics of the eye surface extended as long as it stays irreducible, but the combinatorics that would involve the dual graph and all this stuff, uh, when you get many components, uh, I don't know, I, you know, that could probably get pretty complicated. But that's just an intuitive guess. There's no evidence really. Uh, we're kind of running over time, so are there any questions? If not, let's thank uh, Professor Griffiths for a wonderful colloquium talk. Uh, we can show our, our appreciation. Thanks for the invitation.